The clouds passed away and the wind came down from the northwest with extraordinary ferocity. For weeks, certainly not less than two weeks, the mercury in the thermometer tube was not, on any one morning, higher than 12 degrees below zero. The wind was a steady, fierce gale from the northwest, day and night. The air was filled with flying snow, which blinded the eyes and almost stopped the breath of anyone who attempted to face it. No man could, for any considerable length of time, make his way on foot against it. Imagine yourself writing in your diary of a winter's day by candlelight. While outside, the northwest winds howl, blowing snow against the door, a small barrier between you and the elements. The fire you made in the fireplace begins to lose the battle to heat your log home. You shiver with the fear that your ink might freeze under the harshest conditions you have ever experienced. You attempt to divert your wavering thoughts of the day when a burst of warmth breaks the icy grip to no avail. Scenes like this were common among the inhabitants of central Illinois during the winter seasons of the 19th century. Throughout the recent decades, we have experienced the rage of winter's wrath. To some of us, winter's fury has been a major inconvenience. Stumping transportation or an occasional power outage that disables the use of the internet. Whatever the inconvenience, those before us had to struggle even more. We sometimes forget how difficult it truly was for them. Explore with us the history of those bone-chilling nights when the skies unleash its wrath that defines an Illinois winter. of waving grasses, flat terrain separated by creeks bordered by towering trees. Humans would think that the peaceful landscape was uninteresting, but its simple beauty can be breathtaking. Well, the prairies of central and east central Illinois were largely characterized by tall, warm season grasses of six to about nine feet tall. Now, a tall grass prairie is a community dominated by grasses and flowers, or what we call forbs, and is nearly devoid of shrubbery and trees. Now, these prairie communities were originally maintained by fires, whether they be naturally induced or induced by Native Americans. By 1809, migrants from Kentucky, Indiana, the Carolinas, and New England were beginning to move into the virgin landscape of the Illinois Territory first entering the south and spreading northward through the territory. It wasn't until the 1830s that settlers began to tame Illinois' Serengeti of tall grass prairies and thinly timbered savannas. This was due to the misconception that prairie soils were much less fertile than the woodland soils that pioneers were accustomed to in east and southeast of central and eastern Illinois. What few people realize is that the Tallgrass Prairie community was very diverse and very dynamic and literally it was a Serengeti uh, type of ecosystem that stretched all the way from western Ohio through central Illinois where it really uh, it reached its greatest abundance and then went all the way west into Kansas and eastern Nebraska. Settlers brought with them everything they owned for their new life, which at the time was little indeed. Trees were felled near streams and rivers to place their one-room log home and prepare for growing crops for food and raising livestock. In those days, and especially in preparation for the uncertain winter ahead, heating was a major concern in the construction of their log home. In the cabins, um, just like the Lincolns have, uh, like numerous other settlers have, you know, they've got one fireplace to heat the home. But you might have a loft where you have people sleep. Um, 
And so that, that loft only gets what heat is radiated from that fireplace, from that chimney, uh, into that portion of the house. And so um, if it's 20 degrees outside, um, it's going to be colder inside, even though you've got the fire going. They would certainly live in different ways than we did. Uh, they wouldn't use the, you know, they didn't obviously have open floor plans, uh, but they didn't use all the rooms in the house in the wintertime because it really wasn't economical to heat all of those rooms, especially if you were only going to be in it for such a brief amount of time. And so they would have rooms in the house that they might not use in the wintertime. Uh, in today's home, uh, we've got uh, an open floor plan and uh, you want to be able to utilize all of your space. Uh, and so, you know, you'll heat a, um, 12, 14,000 square foot house, um, our, our, uh, our uh, predecessors uh, would look at that as, as very wasteful, uh, especially considering the fact that, uh, you know, they're not just paying somebody to deliver uh, the propane or the gas or the electricity or what they need to heat their home. They're actually having to go out and, and fell the trees and, and split the wood and stack the wood and bring that into the home to actually heat their home. And so um, they, they probably understood the value of that heat source a little bit more than, than people do in the, in the 21st century. Across the new landscape, neighbors would be a short distance away and villages would be near enough to transport crops for selling. Uh, you know, farm families, uh, when you travel through the countryside today, um, you know, you're going several miles sometimes before you find another house. Once you get into the true country, when you're in the, uh, anywhere near the towns and, and cities, of course, there's the sprawl that comes out from them. But uh, when you get out into true rural areas, um, there are fewer people per square mile today than there were in the 19th century. Once established in their home, clearing trees and plowing the land for growing crops was an arduous task that took a great deal of effort and time to complete and time for planting. Failure to complete the task resulted in a failed harvest and starvation during the following winter. The first year's harvest would be enough to secure food for the upcoming winter. Year by year, the settlers would expand their land in hopes of growing more crops to sell for profit if there was a surplus. The winters before the storm are unusually warm for the settlers of central Illinois. Since agriculture was very much tied to climate, farmers were delighted in the abundance of harvest they could reap through the long, warm growing season. Seeds of corn would be planted in the spring after the last frost. As the warm summer engulfed the region, the inhabitants would devote all the possible daylight hours to cultivating the crops. Well, once John Deere invented the plow, much of the tall grass prairies went into cultivation in central and east central Illinois. And typically during the spring and summer, you would have the land that would be plowed, then disc, then cultivated by various tools. And a lot of these tools are very primitive at the time. You, may have, you might have one plow and then a, a small cultivator, a hose, and the crop would go into the ground and would grow through the summer and cultivation would continue throughout the summer months because no herbicides were used at the time. You also have to remember during this entire period no fertilizers were used and that was really the key that really allowed agriculture to blossom in central and east central Illinois was the fact that these prairie soils of glacial origin were very fertile, naturally fertile, so fertilizers weren't needed too much and therefore an abundance of food could be produced without the use of a lot of chemicals that we see now in modern agriculture. Toiling in the blazing sun and cooling off in summer rains, work continued as it was the goal for survival. Not only were fields planted for food, 
but also acquiring fuel for the upcoming winter was vital to provide heat for home and cooking. Weather forecasts were not yet available, except from the Farmer's Almanac. Yet, to purchase their publication was not a necessity. Knowing how to read the skies was the only tool farmers had to determine the conditions of the day and possibly the next day. Even that was a long-term forecast. And you're talking about a period in history where various settlers from Europe were coming to the United States for, to, to start farming land, and they really didn't have a clear-cut idea of the climate. And weather forecasts weren't available, so certainly they had to rely on signs in the sky to predict weather. In fact, many of the signs that they did see in the sky and tools they used to predict the weather back then are still actually quite useful now in some respects. The warm winters before the storm spawned the idea of expanding the type of crops the settlers planted. Although cotton was a southern crop, Illinois farmers were attempting to dabble in the economic prospects of introducing the crop in the region due to the mild winters. John Carroll Powers, a Sangamon County historian, wrote that he built a cotton gin in the hopes of harvesting cotton. However, in the coming winter of the deep snow, this venture would fail. When the warmth of the spring was in the air, fruit-bearing trees began to bud and blossom. Leaves of the tall grasses across the landscape began to fill with a brilliant green. However, the skies of the north would fool Mother Nature and grip the land with a frosty hand, plummeting temperatures that the region would once again slip into winter. Seeds that were planted and sprung forth with life were killed. Farmers lost most of what they planted. This occasional scenario killed further ideas of introducing new unreliable crops. Well, when the first settlers arrived in central and east central Illinois in the 1820s, uh, we went through a period of quite mild climate with long growing seasons. In fact, doing research, it appears that some of the last frosts in spring at that time were in mid to late March, and the first frost and freezes were in November. So we had a very long growing season, but by the 1830s, around 1830, right up through about 1840, the growing seasons were cut short. The climate turned quite cold, and we had several very snowy, harsh winters that really led to a lot of hardships and caught a, uh, caught a lot of settlers off guard. Southern Illinois uh, has, long had the, uh, has long had the nickname Little Egypt, uh, and it really a, a goes with a biblical reference of um, uh, the, the, the famine, and then of course uh, Egypt uh, was the, the grain basket, and so all of the, the people would go into Egypt and purchase what they needed to take back home with them. And really the same thing happens here in Illinois. Uh, after that year, 1831, uh, you find so many farmers uh, and so many people that live in the central and northern part of the state having to go south to purchase corn, to purchase wheat, uh, to get themselves through the winter. And so, you know, they, they uh, uh, look to the Bible and they look to that reference and they see the same thing happening to them and so they're going down into Egypt to purchase what they need to survive that, that uh, winter in the next year. Even in the late summer season, frost would be significant enough to kill what made it through the long growing season. When crops made it to the harvest and the crops were left in the fields, Howling winds would blow over the groupings and would sometimes bury the stalks during the first significant snow. Risk was prominent in this period. It took every bit of caution to determine when to avoid loss of yield prior to the onset of winter. Winter wheat sometimes failed if the winter was overwhelmingly cold for extended periods. The winter of 1830 is something entirely different. The winter of 1830 began typical, as, as many winters do, very mild on the prairies out here. Uh, to, towards the latter part of December, um, it began with uh, sleet and snow, um, and then the winds came on and continued to blow, and then of course you have the blowing and drifting snow. But all through that year, uh, through that winter, uh, the, the snows accumulated through December and through January. 
uh, and then uh, uh, by some accounts uh, there are three and four feet of snow on the ground and then of course drifting higher in other areas as well. Um, when that happens, you've left your corn out in the fields, which is really typical. They've cut their corn, uh, they put it into shocks, and they leave it out in the fields until they need to bring that in, whether it's for uh, taking to the mill to have ground for cornmeal for themselves, whether it's to feed livestock. Um, in years where you've got heavy snow uh, and high winds, uh, you can lose that corn out in the field. Uh, the corn shocks blow over. Um, they're lost underneath the snow and you can no longer find that. You get the heavy crusts of, of, of ice on top of the snow which in the winter of 1830-31 they had um, intermittent uh, warming spells where they would have uh, more rain fall and then freeze on top of the ice and so it became very difficult that year to support both themselves and their, their, their livestock. Inhabitants of Illinois were not all pioneers as they recalled in the annual Old Settlers Day gatherings. The winter of the deep snow was the turning point that separated those who were pioneers and those who came later. Such an event as the winter of 1830-31 would forever be remembered for years to come and define Illinois for its strength to survive even the harshest winters that had ever been witnessed. Those who came from the south and the east passed down through the generations their stories of struggling through the landscape in howling winds and drifts of snow. To the people that settled here in Illinois, uh, if you came in the spring of 1831, it doesn't matter if you're clearing the land, building your cabin, uh, you're on virgin land, um, you're not a true pioneer in Illinois. Uh, the only true pioneer in Illinois is the one who came before and had to live through that winter of 1830-31. So they, they really use that as the benchmark. Um, and and uh, years later, uh, the old settler societies, um, it becomes a badge of honor if you actually lived here and lived through that winter. And so they, they considered it uh, really a, a very important event in their history here in Illinois. One whose life had been spent in southern New England can form low conception of such a winter. It was impossible to break out snow paths in the New England fashion. On driving a team through the snow, the track behind it would be almost immediately obliterated by the wind. The population around us was almost wholly from the south and had no conception of such a winter. They were well nigh paralyzed by the task imposed upon them. Living conditions were difficult and sometimes inhabitable. People struggled to warm their homes and keep food on the table through the sometimes long winters. During long days when the snow depth caused pioneers to remain in their home, the fuel supply would diminish and had to be resupplied by going out and cutting it. Our fuel was yet in the forest, and even much of our food supply remained still in the field covered by the deep snow. The fear of when it would be possible to venture out was on the minds restricted inside. In addition, during the days of extremely bitter cold, trees would be difficult to cut due to moisture freezing within the trees. Time was important and never wasted. Combating the cold with fuel was only one factor. Having enough clothing to ward off the bitter cold was another. Woolen mittens and overcoats and leather boots were commonly worn. Quilts, blankets, and rough linens were used within their home to protect against the harsh winter nights. Although a fire in the fireplace was raging, it could not overwhelm the intense cold. They certainly would, would cope um, with, the, uh, with the climate conditions uh, far better than we would today because we live in an in a, uh, uh, environment where uh, you know, the, the heat has to be at 68 or 70 or 72 in the winter time for us to be comfortable. It has to be at that same temperature in the summertime for us to be comfortable taking all the humidity out of the air, of course. Um, you know, they're used to uh, more extremes in the temperature because that is their environment. Uh, their homes are not as well insulated and as well sealed as ours today. Um, and so it's not uncommon to um, hear people talk about the winter time. Even today when we have visitors here to Lincoln Log Cabin, um, somebody will say, well, my grandmother or I remember as a child myself in the wintertime, uh, you know, we'd get out of bed in the morning and there would be frost on the blankets. And the frost comes from the condensation from their, 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 uh, their breathing. 
uh, during the night because the home isn't well heated. In the wintertime, you're going to have, you know, uh, men wore capes, uh, men wore shawls as well when it's cold, men wore a house coat inside because really it's about keeping yourself warm. And so, you know, they're dressing in layers, but uh, chiefly it's, it's uh, wool and that wool cloth is, is used to produce uh, heavy coats and um, things like that to keep you warm. Transportation during the winter of the deep snow is extremely difficult. Distant inhabitants were cut off from the villages as the harsh gusty winds created drifts along the known paths. Had our railroads been in existence, I fear they would have proved for the time useless. The deep cuts would have filled with drifts, and even modern appliances could hardly have kept them open. We were obliged to take shelter for the remainder of the winter in some of the new and imperfectly finished rooms of the college building. In, in the early years uh, where the, the first settlers were here, they, they talked about having only uh, maybe shin-deep snow. Well, that's still good enough to get out a sleigh and, and to maneuver about as long as the snow conditions were right. Um, in, in winters where you've got heavy snow uh, and if you've got an ice crust on top of that, uh, which isn't really very thick, um, it's going to be very difficult to get out with your horses and the sleigh uh, or sled um, to travel because you have to actually break through that crust of snow and then you sink down and so you're really um, having to forge a path through the snow uh, to travel any great distance and so in the winter time uh, unless the conditions are just right you're not going to see a lot of travel going on. The calm, warm weather would end as the harsh north winds started to howl on December 10th. Mother Nature came with a vengeance that would forever be known as the winter of the deep snow. The cold wave that swept across the Midwest from Canada on the 21st dropped the temperature to minus 28 degrees at Fort Snelling in Minnesota. The Arctic blast chilled the entire Midwest for 10 weeks. Even those who lived in Texas felt the blast of the north. Throughout the winter, cold waves would leave a lasting impression on those who witnessed the wrath of the north. Periodically, temperatures would rise and leave a layer of ice, which made travel nearly impossible. While attempting to travel to Illinois College, Mr. Beecher was caught in Vandalia during the Christmas holiday and stayed with new acquaintances until travel was possible. Mr. Beecher did not remain at Vandalia till the end of the conflict, but returned during the Christmas holidays to Jacksonville. Simultaneously with the commencement of his journey occurred the historic deep snow, and he found himself weather-bound at Hillsborough, but at the hospitable home of our dear friends, Mr. and Mrs. Tilson. There he met Mr. Charles Holmes, a noble friend and benefactor of Illinois College. As the temperatures quickly dropped, rain fell over the Illinois prairie and caused a man riding a horse to freeze to his saddle. Another story described a family caught in what was known as the Cold Friday. The family of eight had stopped as the snow fell and the wind swept across the open prairie. They did not escape the wrath of the skies that night and were found dead, huddled near their wagon. On December 29th in Kansas City, Missouri, the snow blanketed the earth to a depth of 30 inches. Another witness recorded that 41 inches fell in northern Missouri. Well, the winter of deep snow in 1830 and 31 was uh, characterized by the passage of several rather deep uh, mid-latitude cyclones. And with each uh, cyclone that passed, or area of low pressure, uh, each one would go through Indiana and then about 70 to 80 miles northwest of the low track, you'd have heavy snow across central and parts of east central Illinois. Now, with each progressive storm, you would have a foot of snow 
and then another one would come through and dump another foot of snow. So you had successive layers of snow, and by the time it was all said and done, upwards of four feet of snow had fallen in the region. The wildlife was also victim of the harsh blowing snow. Unable to move quickly to escape the hungry wolves, carcass were found scattered across the prairie. The dwindled supply of feed for buffalo and no place to graze left a smaller population to roam the prairie in the coming spring. As the last frost faded in the warmth of the springtime sun, work began to prepare for next winter's grip on the region. Many throughout the region escaped the chilling nights and the deep snow. For Dr. Sturdivant, the sorrow of the winter returned and his life changed forever. Spring came, and with it a great sorrow. Our darling boy suddenly sickened and died in our arms after an illness of but a few hours. Nothing remained for us but to tenderly bury his loved form in a grave surrounded by a little wooden enclosure on the lone prairie and go on with our work. My wife's heart was almost broken. She never recovered the full buoyancy of her spirits, though several years of happily married life still remained to us. This and many others will be forever remembered in the stories from the winter of the deep snow.